before we start today's roundtable, I want to give special thanks to Chexter, our group sponsor. Chexter has become well known in the recruiting industry by providing a platform that easily captures reference checks in the hiring process. I myself have been a customer of theirs for years. I use a reference checking tool for all of my new hires. However, Chexter has now released a new product suite called Insights. This new product suite is really what has excited me to have Chexter as the group sponsor. With Insights, the Chexter platform now covers employees from cradle to grave and not just reference checking. Starting when they apply, going to offer, through onboarding, then covering their work at your company and then to the end with exit interviews. It's an easy to use, easy to understand way of giving and getting feedback from your peers. Checks your simple goal to build more productive and passionate teams. Now, if this concept of getting insights from your peers regarding your work sounds familiar, it should because that's the simple goal of this group. Connecting, communicating, collaborating. Support me, support the group, Follow the link below, recruiting.org forward slash Chexter. This will take you to a landing page to sign up for a quick demo. If you are just thinking about automating your reference checking process, it'll be well worth your time. But I encourage you to check out the full Insights suite. I'd love to find out if you feel the way I feel about it. Now let's get to today's roundtable. All right, let's jump right into it. Thank you everybody for attending episode 59 in Let's Talk Recruiting, where peer practitioners in the TA industry get together to talk about various topics that we all come across on a daily basis. And today's topic is one of those things that we all come across on a daily basis. Our topic is five characteristics of a great hiring manager. With us today, uh, we have Erica Thorson Gary out of San Francisco. We have Tyler Bird out of Chicago, Stephen Laverne out of the San Francisco area, and Barbara Marks out of the Atlanta area. I, of course, am down in the LA area. So with that said, let's jump into our conversation. And Erica, we're going to jump over to you first, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thanks for having us, Sean. Um, I, this topic is so important. Um, Hiring managers can make or break recruiting and whether you love your job or not. Um, and, and the one topic that I wanted to bring to the table is around the partnership that we have with hiring managers is that if you have a hiring manager that feels as though recruiting is an order taker or that they're lesser than, you're never going to get anything accomplished. Or I should say you're not going to get anything um, productively accomplished is that you will get things done at the hiring manager's discretion at their timeline. But when you have that partnership, you get to work through the problems together. You get to um, learn how that hiring manager is going to best fill and how you can find the right person for their role rather than just nodding your head and not being a consultant in the best way. Um, and I've learned this through many, many years of recruiting. I hate admitting how many years because there's probably people on the call that are younger than how long I've been in recruiting. Um, but I through a variety of industries as well, which really, it all comes down to that hiring manager, trusting and respecting what your talent acquisition team brings to the table. Um, and we fight it every day, unfortunately, but it's really an important piece um, that we teach our hiring managers early on at LiveRamp. We actually talk about it during onboarding of hiring managers to talk through TAs, it's not, not an order taker. We're your partner and we're actually changing our titles from recruiters to talent acquisition partners. Um, it, while it's just semantics, we're hoping that that will help. Um, we have HR business partners, right? They're not personnel anymore, which that's really dated. But by just changing names, it truly does change the line of sight that some people, how people respond to and react to who they're working with. So we're hoping that that's gonna help us a little bit as well. Erica, how do you know when you, when you got that hiring manager? Is it just, you can just tell or is it something? You know, that's a good question. I, I personally, when I do have something on my plate, it's really from the beginning. It's during that intake session that it is, you can give them ideas and they're receptive to it rather than, nope, this is the way I've always done it. Mm -hmm. I've been a, I had this actually happen to me last week. I've been in product for 20 years and this is how I've always done it. Well, how's that worked out for you? Um, I've been in recruiting for 20 years, so I can, more than that actually, but I can, I can give you that advice. So I could tell right off the bat with that hiring manager that it was going to be a struggle where there's others that are actually receptive. You can tell really, really early on. It's building that rapport. And have you ever, like, let's say you got a department that you work in and some, some managers have that trait, some don't. Are you able to kind of flip that manager who has it into a voice for you within that department? Absolutely. And that, that's a really good call out is that you do want to find if this is something 
it, I use it in change management also, but is that when you have somebody that can help you pre-sell, right? Is that if you have that hiring manager that believes that TA is their partner and have them work with their peers, right? Is that they can go out and be a voice for us. This is what TA has brought to us as, as a hypothetical. And they then are able to share it with their teams or with those difficult hiring managers to say they bring a value to the table. And sometimes that other voice, rather than me trying to beat it down their throats, definitely is much more beneficial. No, the company you're in now, they have a, a thousand plus employees, right? I'm, yeah, we're about 1100 global. So you, you were talking about um, part of your onboarding. So I think, I think Stephen and Barbara, you're around, your company is around 500-ish employees, right? I've, I've seen like a well, difference when you, once you get into a company with a thousand. Well, we are so we're uh we have an out of the field we have over four thousand um oh, but <laughs> no, but that's okay but 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 on the corporate level we're probably around three four hundred so so it's almost kind of like we have two companies that we have to work with and and two different types of hires gotcha. excellent so to that setting so two, the two different kinds of onboarding too absolutely yeah okay. So let's kind of address the, the onboarding piece of it, because I, I really, it's coming up quite a bit, the culture of the company, right? And I think you can manage and engage culture when you don't have thousands of people. It just becomes naturally harder once you're, you're up there with numbers of employees. So setting that culture and back to the, hey, does the manager have this trait or not? Instilling that in those that do not, or a young manager who needs to understand how to hire, how are some ways to get in on that onboarding process? Because I think it's really important to make that, hey, this is how we hire at the XYZ company. What are your thoughts around that, that trait and getting in there through onboarding? Is it just, here's, it's on a slide or is this training? Well, but I, I think that's, I think it's all of that. I mean, so we started uh, our, our field managers, we actually have them trained on the ATS by the recruiter. So it's that we do it the second week because we know the first week is full of way too much information. Their you know, info is coming out of their ears by the end of the week. But the second week, um, the recruiter spends about an hour and a half training them on the, on the ATS, on how they're going to use that. Um, but we also, we all together, uh, the team together figured out this is what we want to train them on, not just the uh, – the mechanics of the ATS, but also this is, this, this is a partnership. We started off by saying, this is a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, and this may be the first time they've worked with uh, and had the support of a specific recruiter. So teaching them how to do that. And then saying, this is how you're going to, uh, you're going to expect me to respond in a day. Guess what? I expect you to respond in a day. So again, going back and forth as partners, not, not those order takers. So I, I think, I think the training, but it's, start as soon as you possibly can. Sean, I'd like to layer onto that is that we, thankfully in recruiting, we have a little bit, we can see how these people are going to be during the hiring process also, right? It's that we yes. can, we get to use that to our advantage is that we can, we can, I don't want to say manipulate, but we can make sure that we're hiring people that truly see us as partners. Um, and it's their, their recruiting process that also plays a big role in how they're going to be when they come on board. But we at LiveRamp, we do have an onboarding program and it's a two day, obviously remote now, but is that it was a two day program. We have, yes, we have a, a, a segment that's about recruiting in general, right? So we talk about our ATS, we talk about our referral program, we talk about all that. But then in addition to that, we have online on-demand training sessions that everybody has to attend if they are a hiring manager or if they're going to be an interviewer within the organization. And it's about interviewing and it's about how you work with talent acquisition. Um, and we call them, cert they have to be certified. So our hiring managers have to be certified before we'll actually open a requisition for them. We just launched this about a month ago. So it's in, it's really in infancy stages, but we're finding a huge turnaround is that people are on a, it, a bit of a light bulb goes off of, oh, this is what comes into play. Um, and that's really been helpful. Hopefully it'll continue to be helpful as it continues to develop. Tyler, Steven, anything to add to that around the partnership piece of working with managers? I have a question for Erica. How, you know, working with a candidate through the interview process, how, how many times you have someone that you hired and like they are, and now they're their hire, your hiring manager. And it's just like night and day from how they were during the interview process to what they are now as a hiring manager. Yeah. I hate admitting it. It's happened. Um, 
But it's, what? This isn't how uh, I remember. No, you, and, uh, you were really cordial during our interviewing process. <laughs> and, and it has happened. Um, but I always try to go back to the relationship that we built, right, during the interview right. process. That's what it's all about is, remember, we, we were buddies when you were going through the process. Mm -hmm. Let me be your buddy again. Let me help you out. Exactly. All right. Uh, Tyler, th thank you yes. for that, Erica. I, I'm a, just, let me, I got to ask you one little question around the training stuff, because they are going through tra mandatory training. This is sort of a side topic. Does your company do badges? Like when you earn a badge? No, okay. no. I, my last company though, we did. So you did is that you became an ambassador um, after you'd go through certain trainings and you would earn a badge. It was actually a star on your intranet site, but same thing. Yeah. It's a totally side topic, but I love having those discussions with uh, learning development people to yep. badge or not to badge. Just sort of <laughs> All right, Tyler, let's, let's just Wait, Can I ask you a quick question too? Erica, are you, now that they have to be certified, are you going to add something in for, because it looks like we're in the long haul with, with our in front of me, COVID. Um, are you going to add something in about how to do, uh, uh, you know, video interviewing or online interviewing or? Yeah, so we actually, we're not going to add that into the training session itself, but we have actually, we help our candidates on the front end is that we do a 15 minute prep call with them to make sure that they know how to utilize, we were on blue jeans up until last week, how to utilize Zoom, so we retrain on that. And then we are also making sure that we get the hiring managers ahead of time to teach them, this is how you do it, this is the right way to do it, don't right. show up late. And so the <laughs> typical things, but is that we do make sure that we're talking about how do you do it where it's not as personal when you're sitting, you know, in your dining room and they're sitting in their bedroom, right. how do you engage people that way? So we have those conversations. We haven't formalized a training behind it yet though. Thank you. Absolutely. But I have at Universal Music, uh, the head of TA would do hiring manager by department training where she would go in and focus on a specific team and get them all in the same room. Uh, I got to sit in, sit in on one. It was really interesting to see once you get people in that group, well, I do it this way or I do it that way with somebody who's an expert or specialist in it, the conversations that happen in that, in that setting, uh, in addition to one off, hey, you can go take this course on our, our LMS, but that group learning, really interesting once you get all the people in the room. Of course, that's sort of, that's pre-COVID and hopefully it'll make a comeback. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Erica. Uh, Tyler, let's jump over to you and your item. Yep. So I, one of my big key characteristics of a great hiring manager is open-mindedness. So the opposite of Tyler, I need this, this, and this, and that, and they have to have all those. So let's say like an, they have to have an MBA. They have to come from a financial services industry, have to have prior consulting experience. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's the opposite of what I'm talking about here. So someone that is more open-minded to looking at profiles that might not identic be identical to the profile that they're looking for, but it has characteristics in other areas that might add value um, to, the, to, his, to their team. Um, I guess a good example might be, you know, maybe finding someone that's a little bit more junior, but really hungry to get into that company and has showed the aptitude and the willingness to learn and take on new, new technologies and be able to learn new technologies. Might not have everything in that list of requirements, but shows the aptitude. It might be coming in at a lower level too. So saving from a, from a compensation standpoint, the team and the group and, and the company in general. So being open-minded, maybe looking at candidates that don't have all the skills that they're really looking for, but show the aptitude and the willingness to learn. And they're going to grow their skills here and, and be more interested and probably stay a little bit longer than someone that has all the skills and they're just continuing to use the same skills that they already had prior to coming into the firm. Tyler, you think that trait and getting back to with Erica, do they or don't they, right? Does that make its most... Um, easy appearance at the intake meeting or like upon candidate submission or where do you like clearly see this person is stuck in this tunnel vision and it's different than what's really out there? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's their past experience. So if they've been successful in doing that previously, they're going to be more open-minded to it. So if they're a newer hiring manager that maybe is afraid of making a mistake on one of their first hires, they're going to be less apt to be open-minded on it. So it's kind of I have to do a really good job of selling that candidate, selling the candidate to the hiring managers. This is why I believe that this candidate is going to be great for your team and be able to make you look good as a hiring manager of hiring someone that maybe didn't have all the skills, but they ended up doing even better work 
than someone that did have all the skills. And they're staying longer, they showed the aptitude, they're a hard worker, and those kind of those soft skills to be able to show that. So, so are you calling that out on candidate submission to a recruiter that, or to a hiring manager that was, let's say, nitpicky? Yeah. To, to try and train them? Yeah, no, definitely. Especially if they're newer um, to the firm and newer hiring manager and just in general, I'm definitely making my sell points as to why that I think that they are worth at least that initial call. So these are the, the reasons that, and noting, you know, I'm not trying to hide where that they're lacking in skills either. So noting, Hey, I know you said in the, in the intake meeting that you wanted to have um, power BI experience, but this candidate has Tableau experience, which is similar. They have a heavy data engineering background with SQL already can do a lot of SQL querying. They're interested in getting into Tableau. Hence the reason why, and they showed aptitude to be able to learn. They've already taken Tableau classes just as an example. Um, so, Noting that they don't have it, so I'm not trying to hide anything from the hiring manager, noting where that they're missing it, but then also selling as to, you know, I still think that they're definitely worth a call. It's not a waste of your time at all to have a call or have someone on your team speak with this individual. And, and how is that taken by the hiring manager? Is it a case by case with each one? Because you are really trying to do behavioral change management, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I usually put myself on the line by saying like, listen, I promise you this person is not going to be a waste of your time. So I know if the candidate's going to be strong, uh, they might be lacking, but uh, just making them have that initial call. Cause I think once they have that initial call with the candidate, then they're like, they, they start thinking, but it's, it's pushing to get that initial call is really the, after that, then it's, then it's all, then it's going on going forward. So I'm going to kind of drill down on the tactics a little bit because I think yeah. this is one of those important because it's kind of heads on sometimes this, this piece mm -hmm. of it when we talk about the search. Uh, is that a conversation in an email or is that a phone conversation or face-to-face -face, uh, conversation? Email first, but if they push back and I'm really adamant about this candidate, like I know this and then being a recruiter at my firm for four years, I know what works and what doesn't work. You got to have that confidence too. So if you really don't know it, you can't put yourself on the line there, but I, I know that this is a really strong candidate then I'm going to do whatever I can to push and say like, I promise you, this is not going to be a waste of your time. Just a 30 minute call with either you or one of your, your, your lieutenants on your team or whoever, you know, someone underneath you that I promise you, it's really not going to be a waste of your time. It's a really strong candidate. So again, really kind of push for some of those candidates that aren't necessarily hitting all the areas. I guess, uh, those, are the, those are the hires that I'm most proud of yeah. as a recruiter. The ones that like, I knew that this candidate was strong, their resume wasn't that great, or they didn't have all the skills, but they were just so sharp on the phone, so excited about our organization that they did a ton of research. They've been wanting to work at West Monroe for however many years, been following us over the years too as well that I know that that's a candidate that I want to like do whatever I can to push to at least give them that opportunity to, to present themselves to the hiring manager and the team. Uh, to me that when they say no and you fight to get that person in, that's the, the wreck you remember, right? Oh, always. Later, right? Those, Those stories that happen. Always the most proud of for sure. So to, to all the panelists, again, probably in the bigger picture of the, the change management with people, when we talk about <laughs> traits that the great ones have, trying to get them to have them when they don't, what are your thoughts and kind of focusing on Tyler's piece about really that, that point where we're <clears throat> looking at candidates or not looking at candidates, any thoughts on when you're not getting the partnership or engagement back from the hiring manager in that particular spot around submittals for change for that change management piece? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think, you know, what Tyler said is true, but I think as I tell my team, I mean, we are, we are advocates for the candidate. So we should be advocating for them all the time. I mean, we have a tough job of advocating for the candidate, obviously advocating for the company, being good stewards of the company's money. So trying to put all that together. But, you know, but again, I think the, you know, a lot of managers want that, as we've heard in the, you know, this org, the, you know, the purple squirrel in the room, right? I mean, every manager wants that, that great candidate. But I think some of the best candidates I've ever seen were ones that came in that you would maybe consider a B player. Um, and, you know, they were able to work up to an A player because they didn't check all the boxes. So um, I think, and as managers, we should be in also, you know, encouraging them that, you know, as a manager, you want to train, you want to be able to like train and coach people. So if you've got the bandwidth to be able to train and coach people up, then get somebody there that's got that doesn't check all the boxes and then be able to get them on the team and train them accordingly to get them to where they check off most of those, you know, those, uh, those boxes. Barbara, Erica, anything to, to add? 
I agree with all the great points from Stephen and Tyler. It, I think that they're so important that we continue advocating, as you said, Stephen, we advocate for our candidates. Um, one thing that we do with, that I coach my team on is that our candidates are our customers, right? Is that in, as are our hiring managers. So we wanna make both sides happy. The best way to do that is advocate on both sides. Um, and that is getting hiring managers to see that when you do a really narrow search, you're not gonna find those, the purple squirrels. I call them purple unicorns. Um, same thing. Um, so I think that that's really important that we continue talking about it with our hiring teams. Excellent. All right, uh, Stephen, let's jump over to you and to your items. Yeah. So I, um, with this topic, I, uh, first, I think that an active hiring manager is very, very important. Um, I think somebody that's going to be engaged from the start, from the, you know, again, from the intake uh, session, during the one-on-ones that you have weekly uh, just to talk about activity and what candidates are a fit, what candidates are not a fit. Um, so someone who's very, very active. Um, the next thing is somebody that's flexible. Uh, you know, again, I think, you know, I, you know, as I was saying, not checking off all the boxes, uh, a flexible manager is one that's going to be able to see that and then have a dialogue around why, why we are, uh, so passionate about this, you know, this candidate, uh, you know, that we're advocating and talking about them all, you know, you know, all the time. So some of this flexible, even with like scheduling and those kind of things. I mean, I've worked with, you know, with managers that were hard and fast on something uh, and just to, you know, to have a, you know, to have a talk with them to, you know, to loosen their reins or as we'd say, loosen your constraints um, and not be so tight, uh, you know, I think is good. So, uh, and then a good communicator, I think is one as well too. So uh, I've worked with, you know, with managers that um, didn't communicate a lot. Um, they were really hell bent on, um, you know, their org and they really didn't give us a lot of time. And so, um, you know, we like somebody that's going to be active on Slack, active on email, active in our one-on-ones um, and talking about things and communicating things to where, hey, we need to change this on the job description or, hey, we need to like uh, look and fish in this pool as opposed to that pool. So, um, you know, so that's one. And then the last one is a, a quick decision maker. I mean, I think, um, you know, we have our teams at times that are like, really move the process forward and then you get to the end and then there's a little bit of a stall you know at times and that's because um they're not they're unsure um or they're not um uh totally sold on the candidate um and so i think you know somebody that's willing to make a quick decision uh you know whenever we are trying because again these processes are moving very very fast we're trying to get you know hires in meet goals for each org so you know somebody that's going to be able to make a quick decision when the time comes is also good as well all right, Stephen, so the items that you just ran through, if I could put them into one bucket, I'd call it an engaged manager, right? And yeah. in all those ways. Um, I, I've started doing report. So I sort of want to get into in, in the engaged hiring manager, but the, on top of that, the engaged department lead, right? Uh, and how you kind of bring that engagement with the hiring manager to the department level. I, I started doing reports recruiting reports for VPs of departments that look at their managers versus they don't, they don't care about the recruiting metrics and what the recruiters are doing. They're focusing in on the managers that they're, that they're doing. So kind of layering on top of that engaged hiring manager, any, any thoughts around engaging at the department level to get people to the, to those pieces of what you would call engaged? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, you know, I think um, it's, it goes back to also um, what we preach is the one-on-ones and I think having those, they getting them engaged. I mean, I have always said this, you know, to my team is the one-on-ones are really, really, you know, powerful because it gets us uh, the one-on-one -on -one time. It gets us to have the dialogue. It gets them engaged in the whole process of what we are doing, the buy-in um, and then build, you know, you know, the relationship that you have. Um, so when the time comes to have all of these things, um, it's, things are not moving slow. And I, I just have seen where one-on-ones weren't happening to where when you start doing them, the whole thing changes uh, and managers really, really want to be involved in that process. And, you know, you're building, uh, you know, they're building teams, right? And so as those teams build, they're looking for integral pieces of those teams. So, you know, the more that we can get them involved, I think it's, uh, it's going to be more success for that, that group and that, that, that team. And then obviously the company as a whole. Uh, let me, let me throw another curveball at you around engagement. So we, last session we talked about Slack and people using Slack in the interviewing process. 
Do you think a tool like that, whether it's Slack or Microsoft Teams, what have you, these digital group tools that are taking over the market space, as far as I can tell, they're just becoming everywhere. Is that going to add to engagement, decrease engagement? And I'll, I'll go back to my, my question with Tyler around, hey, are you doing that in email or a, a phone? Yeah. Is, so I think it adds, I mean, you know, kind of like, like uh, Erica said, I'm, I'm older in this business. I think I've, I've been in a, you know, 22 plus years, but, uh, and I think things, the automation has helped because it has helped us stay more engaged um, almost to a fault. Uh, but I think it does help the, you know, help because when managers are in a meeting, let's say that, you know, when you're talking about more of the executive level guys, they're in a lot of meetings and stuff. And so they can't, um, always go to email and so to have their phone in a meeting and then to the, you know be able to slack a question or an answer back uh, so that we can keep things moving I think is absolutely imperative for the growth of the company but I think it definitely does help I I didn't know about slack until I started you know recruiting in the bay and um, it has been an absolute wonderful thing to do and we use it constantly every single day so as, as far as digital converse, phone conversations or face to face, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, we have, you know, obviously with COVID, we, you know, we've kind of moved away from that. But obviously, we encourage people when they're in the office to go to someone's desk, obviously, or to go talk to them. Um, we've got private phone booths in our office where they're two, you know, a two man booth, so we can pull them aside and talk with them if it's private or confidential. But I am a face to face guy, so I I like that. But obviously, with Slack, we have people in other offices and things like that. So instead of picking up the phone or doing something, obviously, Slack is a lot faster because we've got offices in this in you know you know around the globe. So it cuts down on the um, you know you know the downtime. But I think um, any avenue that you can use to be engaged, I think is you know is definitely going to work. And if you don't have Slack or one of those, then you know obviously face to face or phone. Yeah, I think I'm that old guy yelling at everybody to get off my lawn. <laughs> so, so to, to the rest of the panel, that, that engaged manager, uh, big picture thoughts around that? Around How about over-engagement? What's that? Tell me what that's, that's uh, about. Over-engagement. Like, Tyler, where are we at with candidates today? Where, what's going on? I saw this person applied to the role. Did you reach out the to micro them? The micromanager. The yeah. micromanager. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you want to sit down and, and go over a couple searches on, on the search? Like, I mean, that actually is a good thing. I think if they want to really take time out of their day to sit down with you and put together a search string with you, that's actually a good thing. Um, but I feel like that there are probably some over-engaged hiring managers out there for sure. So do we try and walk them back or do we just deal with it? Good question. Is that a case I think, by case? I think it depends on, on the, the manager and, and also what's motivating you know, what, what's behind that? I mean, are, are you paying for the sins of the previous recruiter who didn't provide, who, yeah. you, you know, they had, you know, until, until they poked at that person, never saw anything from that. Um, or is it, this is maybe, in, maybe this is the, one of the first few hires this person's made and they're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't do it wrong. Ooh, I don't want to, you know, hire the wrong person. I don't want to look bad. Um, or is it, you know, oh, I, I just love to do this. This would be great. I, I want to be in recruiting too. <laughs> right. I mean, so I, I think your response has to be about what's what's driving the behavior. Yeah, yeah Barb's right. I think we've 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 run across. Usually, I run across you know managers that are first time managers that want to be yeah. over engaged yes. and don't want to make a bad hire. And I think we've got a group in India now that are like that and uh, tough to make decisions. I'm actually going to meet with all of them. I think in a couple of weeks, but. I have we I have told everybody in the whole company and the managers meetings that we you have to be okay making a bad hire at times. We are all going to make bad we're all going to make a bad hire, uh, right. and so that should ease the tension and get people to uh, you know to loosen up a bit. But I you know I think the more that you have somebody that's just kind of crowding you, like she said, I think you've got to figure out why, and then you've got to walk it back to where they're you know they're not crowding. Let us do our job. Let us we are the subject matter experts. Um, we should be the ones to tell them, uh, Hey, back off a bit. I'll, you know, I'll give you what, you know, you know, what you need, but, um, the over-engaged ones, uh, can be a problem at times. So not that this is over-engagement, but are we getting asked by department managers, department leads to come into team meetings? So to me, that's a clear sign of, Hey, I got I an engaged that. manager. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I'm definitely just knowing where the business is at, where the needs are coming from, being at a consulting firm, even knowing where what projects we have in queue or in the pipeline, and then what skill sets we'll be needing to to help fill some of those. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean, I would say yes, and I encourage that as well too. When I started at Fivetran, um, we were just about at the end and starting our sales kickoff. So SKO was going on, and I started. And I'm walking around. I'm like, "Are we going to SKO?" And everyone's like, "No." I said, "Why not?" I said. So I walked over. I said, "My team's coming to SKO," and so they're like, "Okay." And we really. Once we were there, my team is, you know, talking to me like, Stephen, this was like the best thing. But it's like, we wanted to see and I wanted my team to see a snapshot of past performance, what happened, what's going to be coming down the pipe, and then for the awards and all of that stuff. We're, we're part of all, of all of that. It's like, we don't need to be in the corner, you know, pushed off. We need to be in these meetings, in these events, just like everybody else, because we are part of the growth as well. Yeah. It goes back to what Erica was saying, a partner, a true partner with the business. And, and I, I love the fact that you have a, a different title because I, I think that signals to the business that you're going to bed with them. You, you know what's going on, what's, what's coming down the pike, and, and, and you can sell it. I mean, I, I'm recruiting for a couple of areas right now where they're turnaround situations. I mean, it's a cluster. And, and I'm telling candidates, I'm like, this is a turnaround situation. Like, this is really hard. And they're like, it's a hard job. No, no, no. Like, this is extra hard. And here's why. And, and I think that, you know, we're going to keep the, the, so the person who we select for that role, having heard it from me and then the hiring manager and then HR and like three or four times, oh, this is a turnaround situation. This one's really tough. This is going to be bad. This is going to be ugly going in. So that when they go in, it's never going to be as ugly as we painted it. They don't have a feeling of bait and switch and they're the kind of personality that's going to fit the turnaround situation. So I think without knowing that information about the business, then I just send people in like lambs to the slaughter, right? <laughs> you know, someone who could be good, but they're not a turnaround kind of person. They're not the cleaner, you know, so without knowing what the business is doing and what the business needs, we're kind of operating in the dark. So I think it's safe to say if you're not invited to the party, you can invite yourself and recommend it. Yeah. To oh yeah. 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 Like, like, think about it. They like, they got a million other things about this meeting and they don't recruiting's like, if you bring it up to me, like, that's a great idea. Tyler. Yeah. By all means, please join. You can help better sell candidates on the stuff that we have going on. One trick before I became a recruiter, I would have to go into these companies meetings and I can't believe, I can't remember who it was. But he told me, bring a pizza with you. Right. There you go. If you're nervous about walking in that meeting, you bring a pizza, you'll be everybody's friend. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Barbara, let's jump over to you and to your items. Cool. Um, I, see, I think actually my, you know, I was thinking bring one of five. Um, mine is, does this hiring manager have the ability and the willingness to spend the time it's going to take? Uh, are they going to do that intake meeting with me? Because if we don't do an intake, we're, we're never going to get what you want because I don't know what you want. Um, and I mean a real intake, not, not the five or 10 minute caught you in the hallway kind of business. Um, are they going to respond to me in a timely fashion? When I submit a candidate, I, I expect a 24 hour turnaround time. I, I don't want to, I don't hear about this. I don't have time. Well, then if you don't have time, I totally understand that. I, I have 17 other people who do have time. So why don't we put your job on hold? So I'll just put it on hold. You just let me know when you want me to take it off hold. Um, and and now are, are they going to give me, are they going to take the time to give me specific feedback? Not just a no, but, or, oh, I want, I want some power beyond. Um, but, you know, specifically why? Why is this important? What, what, what went wrong? What, what was the miss here? What was truly the miss so I can figure out what it is? And then, you know, are they going to make the time to do the phone interviews? Are they going to make the time to do the on-site interviews? Are they going to make the time to do the, the de debrief so we don't get stuck in analysis paralysis? So all of that is a chunk of time. It is a chunk. It is hours and hours and hours. And that's gross. When you are a manager to have to give up hours and hours and hours, that means that I have to realize that you're giving me a very precious commodity and that means you're trusting me with it, but I better deliver. So I, I think it's, do they have the ability and, and the willingness to, to devote the time to, to interviewing? And, and I mean ability, because if you know that you're going to be going on a trip to go visit um, other offices, for COVID, or you know, or you're going to be out on vacation again for COVID. You know, you can't do it. It's not that you may have, you may be willing, but you just don't have the time. You don't have the bandwidth. So, Robert, do you ever get managers who are, and the only ones who would do this are those ones that are partnering with you and collaborate with you. 
can you book time on their calendar ahead of time where yeah. I, I've seen this. So is that something you commonly do? Yeah. I, I, I need to know when you're, when you're available so that I can just pop people on your calendar. Cause we'll get to a point where I know what you're looking for and I'll just pop people on your calendar. And okay. sometimes when they hesitate, I'm like, you know what, if, if I put someone on your calendar and that person was, was almost, but not quite, totally fine. I think that was a valid use of your time. If I really miss, then you get to say, I told you so. And you never get to say that's a recruiter. Isn't that nice? And that's my little carrot. So, um, but yeah, I have to know when I can, because just because we all know, just because the calendar is open doesn't mean that they can talk at that time. Right. So I, I need to know what they prefer. Is that, is that something that you clearly ask when, let's say at the intake meeting or what have you, or maybe you're a little bit down that rack. Can I, do you literally ask, can I book time on your calendar without asking? Um, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of yes or no questions. So I would ask it, what times do you prefer for me to put on your calendar? Okay. Do you see Mine that? Is, my favorite close is the assumptive close. So that's why I don't like yes or no answers. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to use that one. Uh, so th this comes back to, hey, when you got those managers who, who are all on board with this to taking that. So to me, that's, that's a that's a bold move. If you're not an experienced recruiter, kind of going back to what Tyler says, you guys. Was I doing that my first couple of years? No, no, no. Um, am I doing that in the first couple of hires? You know, if we're, if we're doing a hire once every while, then it's going to be different. But if, if you're going to be a regular hiring manager with me and, and we're going to do regular business, then, then we're going to start pretty early on. Um, I'm, I believe in leading with trust. And so we're going to trust each other from the get-go and until we don't, until we, until one of us proves to the other that we shouldn't. So, um, and, and why would we do that? We're just going to play nicely in the same box. So, um, and, you know, we're, we're just going to start from, you know, kind of, kind of from the jump, we're, we're going to do it right. So. So let me pose this question back to, to all the panelists. When you do have the managers who have all these traits that we've been talking about, what are some things to do, like just booking time on the calendar, to take it, it's probably a bad way to say it, to take advantage of the situation to make you more effective and to make hiring more, more quick and effective? What are some like, here's things you should be doing when you have these managers, like expanding the scope, like Tyler was saying, to possibilities. Are there any tips or tricks around, hey, if you got that manager who's this, this is what you definitely should be doing. Any thoughts on that? Don't lay off the gas. Keep pushing. Like if you've got a good hiring manager like that, just keep pushing. Just keep pushing the candidates through and keep making hires. I think in our last talk, Sean, we talked about it too. It's like if you've got the manager's time, we have done sourcing jams to where we brought the manager in. He's like, yeah, I'm he or she's available. Hey, we're meeting at this time. Come on in. We're going to order a pizza or have some donuts. Let's go through LinkedIn. Let's look at candidates, you know, together to get your feedback. So we will try to try to utilize that time as much as possible if if we know that they are free. Um, you know, for that, I even invite them to come to my team meetings if I can, if they're free and available. So, you know, people hear everything from them. Uh, there's no hearsay about anything and stuff like that. So um, we've been, I started that probably about uh, two or three months ago where the department heads, I'll invite them in and they'll come in and talk to the whole team. So everyone hears what's going on, anything new, you know, stuff like that. So I, I try to take advantage when they know that I, when I know that they have any free time. Any other additions? Because I know I don't know if you ever heard this phrase. If if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you don't ask, you don't get type situation. Mm -hmm. I just that that's what I love. I love the booking the calendar piece. Uh, I love um, like skipping over resume submittals. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, trust, that's a trust if, thing, if, right? If, if, if I can if I can get out of the resume submittal um, quagmire. I will, I will do it. I mean, but it, but it takes several hires to get there. Um, and, and when I run into trouble where I'm not making hires because I think there's a problem with one part of the process, um, like where, where I think the hiring manager maybe is dropping the ball or is not as engaged or is not as focused. Uh, and I have other hiring managers who are, I'll be like, Hmm, I'm, I seem to be able to make some hires here. Why am I not making, you know, why are we not making the hires? You know, I, if, if I can there are some competition among the teams. I'll do it. Um, if, if I can say, well, we're doing this way here with, with this team and it's working, can we try that with your team to see if it works? Cause it, cause it's worked elsewhere. So maybe it'll work with you. Yep. So. Excellent. Uh, any, any last ads? We've got, we've got a little bit over. I want to 
thank everybody for staying on board. I just think Tyler and I were talking about this before the rest of the panelists got in uh, about 2021, right? And I, I don't want to keep harping on it, but man, I can't wait for 2020 to get here. I know. Uh, I just think it's fingers crossed we're going to come out of where we're at now with everything that's going on. Hopefully, 2020 is going to be okay. We're moving out of the year 2020, literally and figuratively. I just see work and the impact that Zoom had on the world and jobs it had on the world. We went down, now we're back up. Is it going to be everybody's flipping the switch back on or is it going to be a slow roll? I just think there's going to be a great opportunity for TA leaders to kind of use this opportunity to, this is how we need to direct our growth back up. Whether you're a small size company or a large size company looking to get back on where we were before. And just to see how TA partners with the business. I just see on my end, the business is just, they're getting there if they're not already. It's, hey, this is this recruiting thing, this retention thing, very important. The, the DNI thing, it's all on the table now. And technology is enabling options. And if employees have options and candidates have options, once once everybody starts hiring again right now, not so much. But uh, once we get there, it'll be really interesting to see what TA as an industry and profession does with, with the opportunity to kind of set the tone and lead the way. And any thoughts around, and I know it's sort of a big picture question, so no worries if you don't, but any thoughts on um, teaming up with the business units as we go into 2021 or once we're there, any opportunities or thoughts on it? Yeah. Erica, yeah. oh, cool. yeah. uh, uh, did I cut you off? No, I think it was Tyler that was Oh, yeah, speaking. you're good, Steve. Go ahead. Um, no, I think um, we have been working very closely with the business, but I think it's it's in helping, uh, you know, managers because of all the things with COVID, right? I mean, we're, man you know, teaching to manage with empathy and being more understanding um, and having trainings around those kind of things. Uh, but I think, you know, you're right, Sean, I think TA has a real good opportunity now to kind of show lines of business and show leaders like people can work remote. Um, you know, we do, you know, you know, we can build a cohesiveness with, with, with doing Zoom meetings and things like that. Um, I'm not taking anything away from the office because I think office has its place and I think we're going to still keep offices and stuff. We're going to probably downsize some of them, but, you know, I think this is a great opportunity and I think we are trying to take full advantage of it and put ourselves in a position uh, to be a, a valued asset as we keep growing because we're in a huge, you know, growth spurt. So. Tyler? I, I just think 2021, all the recruiters out there better buckle up because attrition mm -hmm. numbers, I don't know about your guys' firms or companies, have been at record low. No one's leaving anywhere right now. They want to stay nope. put until things kind of get a little bit more settled and the markets bounce back. But once that happens, I think people are going to be moving all over the place. Get out of their job that they don't like or they've been sucking it up the last six or seven months during COVID just to kind of know that they have a steady job and a place where they're, they're good but 2021 is going to be a big reshuffle in terms of talent moving, moving all around. So the recruiters, we're going to be busy. That's my thoughts on what 2021 potentially could look like. Well, I both agree with you and hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Any, and I, I think it's also going to be about uh, recruiters better get ready to work in markets where they weren't expecting to look for candidates mm -hmm. because if, if Zoom has taught us uh, anything, it's that we don't all have to be in the same city. So if I can find a developer in Montana. I, to, to your point, yeah. Barbara, I, I saw a, a post from a recruiter who worked at a smaller size, like a few hundred, um, they're a marketing agency. And they totally closed down everything. The plan to go forward is completely remote. And she said, now I get to recruit from across the, the country, maybe even world versus interest in Chicago versus just Chicago. Ah, oh, that's a really interesting perspective. And she's absolutely right, right? It's mm -hmm. the talent pool just, and then it goes back to, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's, I, it's I, think it's, I think it's both. And I think one of the things that's gonna surprise candidates is those candidates who currently live in San Francisco, say a software developer making a buck 40 in San Francisco, is going to expect to be able to take that $140,000 $140, salary which is appropriate for San Francisco and take it and, and move to um, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, where there actually is a Google hub. Um, the, the job will transfer, but the 140 won't. 
And, and I think that's going to be a rude awakening for a lot of people that they think that they can take their salaries with them. But if they move out of a high dollar or, high, you know, a very affluent or very high salary area to a very low salary area, companies, I think, are no longer going to be okay with um, moving that salary. They're, they're going, they're going to start, I think companies are going to start looking at salary zones. Um, the ones that haven't already, I, I think companies have, have done this quietly before, but now that I think the workforce feels more mobile, I think they're going to have to be very loud about, yes, we, we're fine for you to move to Huntsville, Alabama, or to uh, middle of Montana or Oklahoma City. It, absolutely. And your salary will now be 80000 now the 80,000 in Huntsville goes further than the 140 in San Francisco, but we all know from talking about total comp packages and total rewards that people hear the salary and can't seem to move off of that. So I think that's, that, that's gonna be on us as recruiters to really sharpen our sales skills as well. Barbara, what if I took the job in San Francisco for 140 with Google, then moved to Huntsville? Uh, as a re or De Des Moines, Iowa, as, as a remote, right. like, right. do I get to bring my 140 with me? Or? You do, most companies will tell you you do not, but you would oh, be okay. surprised. So most most employees are very surprised by this. And, and I'm starting to hear more and more about this in the market. Um, but I, I think companies that have quietly done that for several years now, uh, especially when you know companies that were based in California are used to paying California prices. And those of us who live here in Atlanta are thrilled by that. Woo! Yay! I'm getting California price, but you know, a salary. But I, I pay. But my house price is not anywhere close to California price. Um, but I think companies are getting smarter about that and now feel a little bit more emboldened. Um, we all know that it's still a candidate market. It's not really an employer market. It, it, you know, we're all still having trouble finding talent. I mean, every everyone I know who's filling is is having this issue. Um, but, but I, I think that. You know, it, as people, you know, as, as people start becoming truly mobile, I think companies are going to have to be very clear about their salary zones. Sounds like an opportunity for recruiting to partner with comp. Is that what we're saying? Uh, well, but I, I think we, we yeah. We, but again, it's that partnership. It's, <clears throat> it's you know, what, what Stephen was talking about. Uh, in, why, why isn't my team going with the group? Like, what, what do you mean? But, but as Tyler said, it's not about that they don't want us. They're just not thinking about it because they're thinking about a thousand other things. So it's up to us to stand there, you know, grab our spines and use them and say, oh, include me. Yeah, me, me, me. Right. And, and be that partner because we need to, they're going to think, oh, I can find all this talent elsewhere. There's a reason why there are talent hubs now. And those talent hubs will, will continue to be there. there. There's a reason why I can't find a ton of developers in Oklahoma City or in Montana, right? Um, it, you know, there's, there's a reason. There, there are all sorts of hubs of people. And yes, you may be able to find them here in Atlanta or in Charlotte or, you know, in, in some other lower uh, housing price areas than, than, in the, than in Silicon Valley. But there's going to be some trade-off because the culture is also going to be different. Interesting. It adds a, in the past, I've worked with sourcing teams who did all outbound recruiting, right? And we, one of the key metrics we would have to track is uh, candidate declines, right? When we get them on oh, yeah. the phone, we talk about the job and they say no. Well, why did they say no? This just sounds the whole work from remote, not work from remote. What am I making? Where, where's the company? Where am I? Uh, no. Because one of those variables didn't match with what they were looking for to, to help. And then this is why I bring in the comp team to it, to get that information from the candidates. The recruiters are the only ones who really know that because they're having the conversation. Getting that information back to comp or back to the finance team to, hey, we're losing this key talent because X, Y, and Z. And if it's comp right. or reload or whatever. Right. All right. Well, life just got a little more complicated for the recruiter. <laughs> Yay. One more thing to do. One more hat to wear. You were bored. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, hey, thank you. It looks like Stephen had to jump. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. I, I think we went off a little bit, but that conversation was really interesting. I just think it's a sign, of, a sign of the times, but I found that very interesting. I didn't know that it was impacting that, that directly. It makes sense, but yeah, it's interesting. Learn something new. All right. Uh, Tyler, Barbara, Erica, thank you very much uh, for being on today's session. I will let you go and talk to you soon. Thank, thank you very you much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.